Over the last few weeks, we've been looking at uh, sorting as a problem. And if you remember our original sort of skeleton of the way we're approaching the course is we have problems, we have algorithms that solve the problems, we have programs that implement the algorithms, and we have processes that are those programs in motion. And the problem we've been working on is sorting. So today, we're flipping to another problem. The problem of searching. Do you remember I told you about Nuth's book, or three books, soon to be four, The Art of Computer Programming, and volume three was entirely devoted to sorting, sorting and searching. It's an awesome book. You could just read this book as a textbook for this course, I reckon. It's a fantastic book. In fact, that's your homework for tonight. Everyone should read this book. Um, so search, s sorting, in the old days, everyone was very interested in sorting. Because you could be an insurance company and you could have all your records and they'd be on punch cards and the punch cards would be arranged in a stack and you'd have to resort them on various criteria and you're constantly wanting to sort your cards. Or you're going to do a mailing list and you want to sort stuff or you're merging stuff. You're a bank and you're merging transactions and you need to update and sort by merging journal entries or something. Or something. So in the old days of big batch processing, sorting was an important thing to do. You've got a whole big batch of data and you want to sort it all in one hit. Uh, and sorting is still important these days, but I think these days the problem of searching is probably becoming more important than sorting. Searching is the problem of I'm looking for something, I know I have it somewhere, or maybe I don't even know, I have this 50 cent piece. Okay, now I do a magic trick, Ooh. oh look over there. Where's it gone? So, did anyone look over there? No one at all. I can still get my four-year-old to look over there when I say it, but no one else does. Um, so it's only her that loses her dessert. Um, so yeah, where, where has it gone? That's the problem of searching. We've got something, we want to find it. Now it's going to be the same as sorting, that we're going to have a thing we're looking for and we're going to have a key. And the key might not be the same as the thing. It might just be attached to the thing. So we're going to be searching for an object given a key. Um, uh, for example, uh, what are strategies for searching? Let's just start thinking about it as a general problem. How could I, like for example, suppose I did want to find that 50 cent piece that I magically transmitted somewhere in the hall. I'm thinking it's under a chair. I could look under your chair, no, your chair, no, your chair, no, your chair, your chair, your chair, your chair. How, how am I going to find it? I guess I could just go through sequentially searching under every single chair till I found it. Or if we were a parallel system, perhaps, I could ask everyone to look under their own chair. Can everyone look under their own chair and see if you find the five cent piece? Can everyone have a look, please? Because I do need it back. <laughs> it's under someone's chair. It's not. No, it's not? Sometimes, sometimes a sort algorithm, oh, you did find, thank you, well done. Well done. Oh, you found one as well. <laughs> Getting a profit. Thank you very much. Now do it for all the other coins. Thank you. <laughs> now, I should do that again. I've lost my laptop. <laughs> That's the problem of searching. Um, I guess in the old days, I'm trying to actually just think through why I think searching is more important or becoming more important. I think in the old days, um, when, say, data was on tapes, searching was sort of trivial. You'd just feed the tape through looking for that record till it came through. Um, but these days we have random access memory. So searching's a bit harder. But I guess in the early days of random access memory, the memory was so small that it didn't really matter how you searched through it. You could just find things reasonably quickly. But over time, We've noticed, I've noticed, and I'm sure you have too, the amount of memory in the world is increasing enormously and now it takes non-trivial amounts of time to find things. So just searching for something on your own computer can take a while because your computer could store hundreds of gigabytes of data. Um, uh, the amount of information is growing very rapidly, so searching become, is becoming a harder problem. But it's not just on your computer. What's a classic search problem? Google, yeah, yeah, yeah. You've got data that's... I don't know, even know how much data Google indexes. Does anyone have a clue? Terabytes? Yeah, I reckon. I uploaded my terabyte drive to Google yesterday. That's, so, yeah, they've got to be having enormous amounts of information. The, the search problem you can see is really important. 
There's no point. In the early days of the internet, when I used to use it, sometimes someone would show me a web page, and I'd go, that's a cool web page. I better write it down. And if I ever lost that piece of paper, I was doomed because I could never find that page again. And when search engines started coming out, we couldn't believe our luck. They really filled, filled a void because now, we, when we wanted to find something, the search engine would find it for us. I could never find it. There's not enough time. But the search engine does all these very, very clever things, and it can find things quickly. The searching problem is a really significant problem. But it's not just you know, Google. It's like, um, uh, suppose I've got an enormous, I don't know, file of scientific data, and I have to find a piece of it that's interesting. I've got a whole gene sequence and I need to find an RNA fragment or something like that. That's a searching problem. Or I'm looking at um, uh, uh, images I'm getting from some amazing telescope in outer space and I'm looking for black holes or something. So I'm searching through looking for the signature of a black hole. So this searching problem is sort of um, now necessarily on us. Now we have the ability to generate vast amounts of data. We've got to put our hand on the bit we need. So that's searching. So what are strategies for searching? Well, um, the classic search problem, I think, that started a little off was, where's Wally? You have to find Wally, and he's in a picture. How do you find Wally when he's in the picture? What strategy do you guys use? Color, surrounding thing. You, you just hunt around. You, you actually make a, a frame? Oh, you just make search. Oh, yeah, you just keep looking. If you look and you see there's a giant, does that give you a clue where Wally is? No. So you just got to look again and look again and look again. So the result of every look that's unsuccessful sort of doesn't give you any help. But eventually you find him. And that's called a sequential search. We just look and look and look in all the different spots until we find him. And we have to look at the spots in some order. So what's one way you could possibly speed up a sequential search? If I've got a gigabyte of data and I have to search through it for something, what's my best strategy if I have to use sequential search? Bogo search? No, bogo search, can't, it can't be worse than that. Unless you use Sheckley search. Has anyone heard of Robert Sheckley? Uh, what were you going to say? Get two people searching. Get two people. Yeah, parallel search. That's what we tried to do. Uh, uh, he just reminded me of Sheckley search. And y y your um, comment also does. Robert Sheckley is a very, very funny science fiction writer. And he did once write a book in which someone was stuck on a strange outer planet somewhere. And all these aliens were walking by. And he was hunting for something, his partner or something. And he met this really wise alien. And he said to the wise alien, I don't know where my partner is, on what planet, in what galaxy. I don't know anything about where they are, and I need to find them. And the wise alien said, well, when you're looking for someone, by the sort of reciprocal nature of all the rules of the universe and the symmetry of physics, they're sort of, although they might not know it, looking for you. Because when you found them, they've found you. So it's this like symmetrical relationship. And he goes, oh, yeah, that's true. And he says, now, when you're looking for someone, the very worst thing, if you're wandering around looking for them, if is if they're wandering around looking for you, because you'll never meet each other. The best if one of you stays put. And he goes, oh, OK. Now, you can't communicate with your partner. So there's no way you can tell your partner to stay put. So I suggest your best way of finding the partner is just standing still. <laughs> and he says, that's completely ridiculous. And then his partner just walks by. <laughs> it's very, very funny. So that's a crazy way of searching. But uh, that won't work in uh, random access memory, unfortunately. So, yeah, if you're searching, uh, s s uh, doing a sequential search, what's your best strategy? There's got to be a be best strategy rather than just BOGO search. Binary search isn't going to help you if you're doing just a sequential search. Binary search is uh, where we use information about the key. It's like, um, suppose you're playing Minesweeper and y your job is to search and find mines. An unsuccessful search gives you information, doesn't it, about surrounding elements. So the result of each search gives you extra information you can use to improve your future searches. But with an oblivious search, like the Where's Wally search, each search is, doesn't give you any clues at all. So binary, search rely, uh, binary uh, searching relies on the fact that we can compare keys. But if we're just doing an oblivious search, we can't do that. Yeah. So a sequential search, come on, you guys, you've got to find something. Oh, oh you've lost your car keys. You're racing for the lecture. You've got to get to the lecture on time. You don't know where your car keys are. What's your best strategy? You're going to have to do sequential shirt search because looking under the bed and finding a sock isn't giving you any clues about where the keys are. So unsuccessful probes aren't going to tell you anything to improve your search. So you're going to have to do a sequential search. What's your best strategy? Look where it was before. Yeah, look in the more likely places first. It sounds obvious. <laughs> That's what we have to do. So if you're doing a sequential search, Look where it's most likely to be first. Now, um, there's, um, 
there's an interesting couple of approaches to this. So suppose you were um, having to look for Wally. No, no, not suppose you're having to look for Wally. Yeah, suppose you're having to look for Wally. And you want to look where he's most likely first. How could you get an estimate for where in the picture he's most likely to be? He's red and white. He's red and white. Yes. But sometimes, and this is really unfair, they put other red and white things in the picture just to make you think, oh, it looks like Wally. So, yeah. So, what's that? The most crowded area? Yeah, I mean, what I'd probably do if I was approaching Where's Wally in an analytical manner is I'd probably look at each of all the other Where's Wally's that's been published that I know the answer for and look at all the different ways the author hides Wally and look at any trends or patterns that are developing and tricks they use and start to form theories and hypotheses about where they're most likely to be. Ah, it's never under C. <laughs> never pick C. It's always somewhere else. So uh, I'd try and get some sort of a priori estimate of the likelihood of all the places he'd be. And I'd look there. If I was um, uh, uh, a computer program, an operating system running, and I had to find, someone asked me to find a file or grab a piece of memory, it's probably most convenient if the files or bits of memory that are most likely to be requested, where should I probably put them? Yeah, the places I'm going to look first. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I guess two strategies to optimizing sequential search are one, get a prior estimate of where it's most likely to be, or two, well, we'll look at two in a sec. So, um, a famous guy, Zipf, uh, who invented the bicycle puncture, actually, a famous German, uh, worked out a theory that by looking at natural language texts, the words in the text didn't occur with uniform frequency. In fact, the nth most common word occurred with frequency proportional to 1 on n. So the third most common word occurs roughly with frequency c on 3. And the ninth most common word occurs with frequency uh, c on uh, 9. So the ninth most common word is three times less likely to be found than the most common word. Does that make sense? And if you do some maths and fool around with that, you can soon work out that if indeed your distribution does have, things aren't equally likely to be looked for is what I'm trying to say. People just naturally place things so that more common things occur. There are more common things and less common things. Uh, so if you are wisely able to predict in advance the most likely things that people would be looking for and the least likely things people would be looking for, and you're able to order your list of data so the most likely things are at the top and the least likely are at the bottom. And if the frequency distribution really was as given by zip, then how much time are you going to save by doing a sequential search on this order data rather than just on random data? What's the speed up, do you think? Well, it's, it's hard to work out, <laughs> looking behind. It's hard to work out. How could you work it out if you were a mathematician? That's the right answer. How could you work it out if you're a computer scientist? Do some emulations. Yeah, yeah. So there's a good puzzle for you. Distribute data according to this Pareto distribution. Well, distribute data randomly. No. Distribute it according to this distribution, not the Pareto, the pr zip distribution. Generate a series of random queries according to the zip distribution. So you search for A. Um, with, if a, you're going to say A is your most fr uh, frequently occurring thing, you'll search for A, C on N of the time. And if you're searching for B, it'll be, uh, sorry, C on one of the time. And if you're searching for B, and that's the next most common, you'll search for that, see on two of the time, and so on, and so on, and so on. Organize your queries that way, and count how much work you do, and you will find the saving for using this very clever strategy of putting the most common thing first. But the problem is, to do that, we have to know in advance that A is the most common thing, and B is the next most common thing, and so on, and so on, and so on. And we're normally too lazy to work that out. And if we tried to work it out, we'd probably get it wrong anyway. So how could you um, store the data so that the most likely thing you're going to want is at the top, even though you have no idea what the most likely thing you're going to want is. After you've looked for it before. If you've looked for it before, that's right. This is what we'd call a self-organizing data structure. Very nice. Initially, just have everything completely random. And then if someone looks for something, after they've looked for it, move it closer to the front. Two strategies suggest themselves. How far towards the front would you move it? Yes. Then the things which you never access would be at the 
Yes. Every time you access an item, you put it at the top of the list. So that's just one swap. Oh, not a swap. Oh, everyone has to shuffle. Well, hmm. Hmm. Bit of work there. Hmm. Okay, we we'll have to think about that a little bit. But I like, I like your idea. It would work well on a linked list. On an array, maybe it wouldn't so work so well. What would we maybe try on an array? What's that? Create a new one. Yeah, well, you see, the problem is um, the poor person, see, we're using the guy that's asking the question as a guinea pig. Some poor person saying, hey, do you have, um, what's, you're at a video store, the world's worst movie, Love Actually. So you say to the guy, do you have Love Actually? And he says, yeah, I do. And he pulls it out and you say, ah, oh, I thought so. And you walk out of the door. When he, he's got to put it back at the top of the pile, so it's sitting there waiting for the next time that someone asks. That cost of him taking it out and putting it on top of the pile, that's being charged to me. I'm the person asking the question. That's all happening with my, inside my query. Does that make sense? So what we're doing is we're not, rather than constantly resorting this thing every now and then, so using statistics to work out which is the most common one we've got and occasionally taking a pause and reordering everyone, we're sort of amortizing the cost. And we're saying every time there's an access, the person doing the access pays a small price and the list gets slightly improved. And it doesn't help them. It's like you filling in end-of-year feedback on a course. It doesn't help you at all, but it makes the thing a bit better for the next person to ask the question. So we don't want to make them do too much work, because that wouldn't be fair. So we don't want to create a whole new list and copy everything across. Who likes love, actually? <coughs> you do. Oh, My daughter was asking me what's wrong with it. I couldn't articulate it, so I was suspicious, because you should be able to have well-articulated reasons. So I'm going to work hard on that. And you should work out well-articulated reasons why it's actually as good as four weddings and a funeral. Okay. And then we, will ha we can have a debate. Okay. And that would be cool. That could be a question in the exam. Um, so, we don't want to copy the whole thing across. What can we do on one axis? Swap. Just swap it up one. Yeah, sort of like do a really slow motion bubble sort. Every time someone accesses something, we could flip it with the guy above. Small amount of work, and over a long period of time with lots of people doing queries, we'll slowly organize the list in such a way that the most frequent things occur at the top. Now, of course, the frequency distribution of requests could change over time, and that's going to stuff us up. But if it's roughly stable over time or only changes slowly, more slowly than the adaptive behavior of the list, we're going to get some sort of speed up. How much of a speed up, that's for you to work out yourselves using some sort of simulation. But it's quite significant. That's sequential search. Sequential search isn't so good, though. Um, it's still very expensive. Another form of search, I'm just looking. Uh, oh, yeah, yeah, sorry. I had another example of a search of why we'd want to do a search, just to show you that it's quite a generic thing you'd want to do and how useful it is. Often you have to do searches on databases to find things, so you've got to look things up on a database. So databases are really interested in searches. Here's another sort of crazy search, though. There's, in the universe, how many four two-for-ones are there? How many four two-for-one programs are there in the whole universe? There's not an infinite number of them. There's a lot of them, but how many of them are there? 16 to the 16. 16 to the 16. There's 16 values that can go in each square, so there's 16 to the 16 possible ways of filling this in. So there's 16 to the 16 possible programs. These aren't arranged in an array or anything. They're just virtual programs. They're not in a structure already. Nonetheless, we might want to search amongst this virtual structure to find something really interesting. Like we might want to find the one that takes the longest to execute before terminating. That's a search problem. Can you see that? Search is sort of ubiquitous. It comes everywhere. Um, that reminded me of something else. What was it? What was I just saying? 16 to the 16. Busy beaver. Oh, it'll come back to me. I had something really interesting to say. Oh, yes, yes, that's right, that's right, that's right. That's right. Um, your task two, I seriously did forget it. I'm not being a dick. Uh, your task two is exactly that. You are going to have to find the busiest busy beavers. Okay, so. It's very exciting. It's very exciting. Okay. Um, I can't believe I forgot that, actually. Lucky I remembered. Uh, okay. All right. Now, um, we'll have a moment's respectful mumble. Mumble. I'm going to do it too. Oh my God, I can't believe he's doing that. What do you think? Is that a good task? Oh, yeah. Yes, it's an awesome task. What do you think? It's 
<laughs> it's going to be really hard, but it's awesome, isn't it? What do you think? Speaking of busy days. Are you working on it now? Excellent, excellent. What do you think? Good task? Uh, ask you after. Ask you after. <laughs> it's like, some people already, no, no one's finished it. No one's finished it. No, I'll tell you more about it later on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. It's a searching problem, so you've got to find something. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, so, search, search, search. Let's come back to search. So we've looked at the idea of sequential search. It's not a very interesting search, was it? But we did find we could optimize it by at least looking in the most sensible place first. Let's now sort of follow the same path we followed with sorting and now try and improve our strategy gradually over time. Let, well, I should just say, uh, if we're following sorting, if I'm doing a sequential search on n items and they're in an array, uh, how much work am I going to have to do? I'm deliberately not giving you the whole question. So what I'm hoping you're going to say is you're going to come back to me with a question. You're not going to answer me. You're going to say, I can't answer that question unless you tell me something else. How much work are we going to have to do? Ah, that's the question. On average, best case, worst case? What's the best case? One. What's the worst case? N. That's if it's in there. What if it's not in there? What's the best case? And yeah, you can't escape looking at everyone. You can't know it's not in there until you've checked every possible place. Curses. You can have a sinking suspicion towards the end, but you've still got to keep looking. Uh, um, uh, so, yeah, all right. So an average, well, average is hard to talk about. On average, I guess, if everything's uniformly distributed, it's n on 2, isn't it? But like we looked at before, things in life don't come uniformly distributed. So average always has a caveat that we need to really know what distributions we're talking over. But if we're saying things are random, then n on 2 on average. But let's just say best and worst case. It's either linear or constant time. Also, we're looking at pretty fast algorithms, but the problem is linear or constant time in n, linear in n, that's only going to be really cool if n's not too big. And as we've seen, the problem with the world these days is n's getting ridiculously big. So even linear time algorithms aren't good enough. We've got to be faster. So let's use some of our ideas from sorting. And the first idea came from Clifford before. He's wearing a Google t-shirt. Why are you wearing a Google t-shirt? Like you like Google. Get out. <laughs> out. <laughs> oh, man, just everywhere I go, Google's looking at me. I'm just thinking, you're, are you reporting back anything to them? I'm <laughs> oh, never, never. It's a secret. Okay, so we oh, they've gone. <gasps> there were two Google people here, and my plan worked. <laughs> okay, um, uh, what was I saying? <laughs> Sorting, searching. Yeah, I'm, I've really got it. It's slowly rewinding my. I'm actually doing a sequential search now. It's quite crazy. I'm rewinding my thoughts over what I said. I wish I could do a faster search than that. All right, and I've just remembered what I was saying. Yeah, okay, so the other way we can speed it up is by using properties of the key, like um, Cliff was saying before. Maybe an unsuccessful search will actually give us more information that will let us hone our search down, and that's binary search. Binary search doesn't work on random data, but if we have ordered data in a table, then what does every unsuccessful search tell us? whether we need to look to the left or the right. Every unsuccessful search knocks out approximately half. So if we halve every time doing binary search, we find we have a search algorithm that is log n, which is pretty cool. OK, so we're getting better. But unfortunately, our data has to be sorted. So now we actually, if we're doing a proper analysis, we now have to think, what's the cost of sorting the data? It's probably n log n, isn't it? You can get it down to linear time, as you've seen, in particular cases if your keys are really good and you know the distribution. But in general, you're stuck with n log n. So we're going to sort it in n log n, and then we're going to do one search. Well, it was scarcely worth the sort, was it? Might as well have just left it as it was and done a random search. That would have cost us n rather than n log n. But if we do a large number of searches, then it was really worth sort of spending that cost up front. So when you do analysis now, you can't just do it based on one transaction. You sort of have to amortize it over the whole use of the data structure. You have to work out, well, I'm going to create it and sort it initially, and then I'm going to do 512 lookups. Here's my overall cost. So rather than look at a cost per lookup, we have to look at a sort of average cost over the life of the thing. OK, so sorting's pretty cool, and that gives us binary search, and we've talked about that ad, uh, uh, quite a lot. Um, if we've got an ordered table, another sort of search, uh, just worth mentioning, is a sequential search. How is a sequential search on an ordered table different to a sequential search on a random table? Use 
You can use indexing. Oh, suppose, no, we're just going to use a sequential search. So we're just going to go through one at a time. Yeah, so we could do all the speed ups and do clever things. But no, I'm just going to do a mindless sequential search. Check the first one, check the second one, check. Is it him? Is it him? Is it him? Is it him? Yes. So I'm only comparing keys for equality. I'm not using greater than or less than. You know when to stop. You know when to stop. When? When the item you're looking for, like the item you're checking is lower than the item here, is higher than the item you're looking for. Yes, and that will tell you what will information, that's spot on. And what information will that tell you? Um, that the item you're looking for can't be in the rest. Yes, well done. Yeah. So your best is still 1, your worst is still n, if it's in the table. But if it's not in the table, before it was always n, and now your best is 1 and your worst is n. So for items not in the table now, we're a little bit faster. But binary search is heaps faster. OK, so we've looked at um, comparing the keys and moving around. What other strategies are there for sorting? Well, maybe let's not sort on a table. Let me, uh, I've just got my timing here. I'm trying to do a lot today, so let me just check. Do, 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 do. Yes, we've got heaps of time. That's really good. All right, so we're not going to sort on a table, say. When you do a binary search, suppose I'm going to do a binary search on the numbers 1, 5, 7, 9, 16, 25, 30, <coughs> 41. Suppose I'm searching on these numbers. Uh, and I'm looking to see if uh, 4 is in the table. First of all, where am I going to look? First of all, I'm going to check with the 9. And it's less than 9. So where am I going to look now? And it's less than 5. So where am I going to look now? 1. And it's bigger than 1, so where am I going to, what am I going to do? Oh, bum, it's not in there. Can you see that the process of sorting looks a bit like taking a trace through a tree? And if you look at all the possible sort behavior, all the possible, I said sorting, I meant searching. If you look at all the possible search behaviors, you're actually going to generate a binary tree, a binary search tree. When you had, one of the questions is how, one of the questions from the lab last week was how are you going to test a binary search? What sort of test would be good on a binary search? And I gave you that sample code that someone had written, and they'd written a few crazy ad hoc random tests and it passed them and they assumed the code was correct. But if you wanted to test a binary search properly, what do you have to search? What do you have to test? <laughs> not in the item. What's that? Uh, not in the data. The item not in the data. Items not in the data. Items in the data. And I think you should ex expand and test the whole tree. So for a, try a tree of size 1, your unit test should be generate a list of size 1 and look in all the possible places. For a list of size 1, there's uh, three possible places. It's in the tree, it's less than the smallest, it's bigger than the greatest. And then try for a list of two, and then try for a list of three things. And search before, before the one, oh, I'll draw it like this, before the one, search if it is the one, search between the one and two, search for the two, search for something between two and three, search for three, search for something bigger than three. And you should systematically go through searching for them all. And that will generate this whole tree, and you'll put your program through its paces. And if there's one corner case that fails for some particular place on the tree, as happened with the particular sample one I gave you, and, and, and it only happens for that one particular obscure spot of the tree, then you'll find it automatically. But if you just guess examples randomly, you're just taking random probes through the tree, and maybe you'll hit the error, maybe you won't. So that's not a very good way of testing something like that. Try have some sort of systematic test. A random tests are great as well, but don't forget the systematic test. OK, so you sort of know how to sort search through a tree. Can I double check? Because everyone has seen trees in the previous course. Uh, that was a wrong way of wording that question. <laughs> who, who has already seen trees? Who has not yet seen trees? Who hasn't seen trees but is too shy to say so? Oh, I couldn't trick you. <laughs> okay. All right. I'm going to. I'm going to just. I'm going to assume you know enough C that you could work out trees if you needed to, and I'm going to tell you something about them in two or three seconds, so you can go and work it out if you haven't seen them before. But all a tree is, is, well, how we implement a tree is it's a struct that contains three subfields, 
it contains some sort of value and it contains a left and it contains a right. And the left and right are both trees. So if I was making a tree out of this guy and it was going to be a balanced tree, remember we like the balanced tree because they give us that nice logarithmic behavior we saw at the last lecture. It would look like this. There would be nine, my tree would be a nine, and underneath it would be two subtrees. So my whole tree, I'm going to draw a tree as a triangle. My whole tree looks like that. It contains a node and two subtrees. And what's the subtree on the left? Well, it's a node which contains a five and two subtrees. And what's the subtree on the left of the five? It's a node that contains a one Woo. and two subtrees, which are both empty. Which notice are these two spots here? And the one on the other side is, thank you, a seven, and that contains two subtrees that are both empty. And on this side, we've got a 25, and so on. Okay, you see. So this is what a tree looks like. This is how we represent it, it's simply a struct containing three values. It looks just like a linked list, which is a struct containing one value, but in a linked list, each value just changes to one more value, with your pointers, and in a tree, each value changes to two. So it's like the rabbits, it's like exponential growth, isn't it? We just, the number of nodes increases rapidly, and each one of these extends to two, and so on. So we get a tree. Okay. Now, I hope those of you that already understood trees aren't now more confused than <laughs> my brief explanation actually was positive. You know the advantage of a tree, I think, in one context, which is if the items in the tree are sorted, in other words, if they have the behavior, uh, the property that all the data on, in the left subtree is smaller than the node, and all the data in the right subtree is greater than the node, and if that property recursively holds throughout the whole tree, and all subtrees, and the subtrees of the trees, and so on, so on, so on. Uh, we call it a binary search tree. And that's a very nice property, because as you saw in the last lecture, um, it helps us find things in logarithmic time. We can zoom down really quickly, and if we have to insert, we've got lots of juicy insertion points sitting on the edges of all these places, these are all the insertion points. So if you want to insert something in an array, it's a pain you have to shuffle everyone along. But in a tree, you just magically have an insertion point at every place you might want to insert. That's all these little crosses along the bottom. So it's very convenient. It's a very nice structure for searching. If we can somehow manage to maintain a tree, we can search it fast. And the notice the nice thing about trees is you can build them slowly. It's not like a sorted array that you sort in one hit and then add things to. I guess. In the array, you can add things to it slowly, but you have to then insert them into the right spot. And we've got the insertion sort problem then. It's quite expensive to maintain the sorted property of an array, but it's very cheap to maintain the sorted property of a tree. So arrays are sort of good for that old-fashioned 1960s, 70s insurance world of doing everything in big batch transactions. And trees are very nice for the modern um, small transaction-driven world where you make small changes to a structure all the time and you want it to retain some property without having big cost. So we can see trees, especially binary search trees, trees that have this ordering property are very convenient for searching. I just got to double check you know two things. You know, you, I assume you know how to add to a tree. I want to check you know how to delete from a tree. Maybe I shouldn't have done scribbles here. Maybe I should have written the whole tree out. Let me just do that very quickly. So 25 goes to, and while I'm doing that, think how are you going to add to this tree and then think how are you going to delete from the tree and still maintain the binary search tree property. Uh, so uh, 25 contains 16. See, I didn't have to do much. I shouldn't have given up then. I was almost at the end. Who would have known? Okay, I'm going to add to a tree. I'm going to add um, the number 20. All right? What's my algorithm? If I'm inserting into an empty subtree, if I'm inserting into an empty tree, put it straight in. If it's not an empty tree, then compare it with the value in the node. If it's greater than the node, insert it in the subtree on the left. If it's less than a node, insert it on the subtree on the right. And that recursively will just go down and run down and down. And eventually it'll go, um, what's that? Bigger than 9, smaller than 25, bigger than 16. It goes here. Insert into this subtree. So now we create a new tree. Very small, sorry about that, which contains a number 40, whatever it was, 20. And two little. All right, that's my insertion algorithm. And notice it preserves the property and gives, creates new insertion points at the same time. And everything's magic and it just works just like we want. All right, now I want to delete from the tree. How am I going to be able to delete from the tree and maintain the ordered property? <laughs> Let's look at the easy case. What's easy to delete from this tree? Nine. Nine? <laughs> Nine. Nine. Now, I don't want to have this. Some people are going to say, but I don't want you to say this. You could do it by just deleting the nine and then putting some special flag value in here to indicate that it's a deleted node. 
and you're going to mix up your data and your metadata. And some of you who are a bit more um, thinking, oh, maybe I shouldn't mix up data and metadata, are going to say, oh, maybe we need a fourth field down here that says has been deleted or not. Uh, and uh, yeah, actually, we'd better do that. We can't put a dumb value in here because if we put a dumb value in here, we wouldn't know where to go next time we had something to. So we'd have to keep the old nine but record that it was deleted or something. Oh, we could do that, but that just seems very yucky and messy. Let's have a better way of deleting things. It actually deletes the guys. How are we going to do it? Yes? Rotate, well, look, you can rotate trees, and that's a very clever answer. But even a, a, a dumber answer would answer this problem quite right. So that, that's a very clever answer. Hold on to that answer. Yes? So you could add the 5 to the 25 tree. You could add the 5 to the 25 tree. Oh, yeah, that's very clever. Yeah, yeah, that's clever. But before we go to your clever solution, did everyone see his clever solution was we delete the 9 by just really deleting it? hanging a pointer off to this guy saying this is a new stop of the tree, moving this tree so it hangs off down here. Very clever. And would still, what's your name? James. James. Did you just work that out then? Yeah, cool. That's really good. And that would still be an ordered tree. It's getting long. We're sort of losing our balancedness a bit. But it's, it's, uh, that is right. You've preserved the property. Well done. But there's an easy, before we even solve the hard case, because you're all trying to delete the nine, you're jumping in straight for the hard problem. And I think this is a characteristic of computer scientists. As soon as we see a problem, we think, oh, I can see there's this really hard problem lurking in there. I'm going to try and solve that. And straight away, we forget about everything else, and we focus on the one really hard bit. But actually, I think it's best to focus on all the easy bits first. And by the time you get to the hard bit, you might find it's managed to shrink a lot, because the easy bits have taken a lot of the strain. Or maybe you'll find you didn't even need to do it. So I find computer scientists, especially really smart ones, often just sit in their rooms for days and days doing nothing, trying to solve the hardest problem. And nothing on the whole project happens at all until they've solved the hardest problem. I hope they can solve the hardest problem, otherwise nothing on the whole project will ever happen at all. Better to solve the easiest problems first, and then at least if you have to stop halfway through or you're hit by a bus, you know the story of computer scientists are always hit by buses, it's very sad. So if you get hit by a bus, at least then your legacy is not just a whole lot of wishful thinking, but you've actually written some code. Yes? I don't think it works now to take away the nine and then point the five. Point the five. Oh, point, take away the nine and point the five to the 25? Oh, yeah, it's a bit tricky. You'd have to do a bit of fiddling. You could make it work, but it's, it's a bit more fiddling. But what's an easier case? You guys are all still trying to solve the hard case. What's the easiest element to delete? Let's change the problem. Don't ask ourselves how we delete the nine. That's going to give us a headache. Delete from the bottom. Delete from the bottom. Which one do you want to delete? 20. 20. No, delete another one, because I'm fond of 20. One. Delete one. How do we delete from the bottom? Easy. Go to the node, delete it. Tell the parent above that it's across. Oh, it's a bit sad, isn't it? I won't say it like that. Um, uh, uh, tell the node above that it's a, a null. I'm just going to move on completely. OK, let's forget about that. So yes, that's how we delete it. What's the second easiest case? To delete five. To delete five. If someone only has one um, descendant, then you could actually just delete that and reroute this down like that. Does that make sense? We deleted the one already, so this one only had one descendant, so we can just plug it in where it, it used to be. It can replace its parent. Um, so, uh, so we're done with the two easy cases. All right, let's face up to it. We've got to deal with a hard case now. How are we going to delete this nine? So we have nine nines. How are we going to do it? Ah, this is very clever. Say this. Take. Take the, num the smallest number from the right tree and put it back to the nine. We could take the smallest number from the right tree and put it up to the nine. The from the lowest. He's very clever. <coughs> so if we find the smallest number on the right hand side, which is uh, 16, we move that. Uh, oh, sorry. We, uh, what are we doing? We're, uh, where, what are we, where are we putting it? Putting it up to nine and deleting nine. So we're what? Moving this node up to here. The problem is it's, uh, it's got a child. <laughs> it's a good idea. I think you've got the right idea. We just gotta just just gotta have a few fiddles. Let's try as so let's divide this hard problem into two slightly easier problems. Let's pick one that doesn't have a child. We could put the seven up. Oh well it's actually that's trivial now, isn't it? So suppose we've gone back to this world, so there was some number here. Five. Five. You could take 
the biggest number on the left, or the smallest number on the right, and you could stick it up here. Now that's easy if it has no children. Yep, just take the seven, move the seven to the top. Uh, copy this value, uh, up to here. Uh, well, unfortunately here, for example, the smallest has a child, but notice the interesting property is how many children does it have? It can't have two children, because one of them would be smaller than. So if it's got one, it's quite easy. We just delete the 16 out, because we can delete with one child easily, and we could move the 16 to the top instead. And we'll put poor old Mr. Seven back if we do it that way. Does that make sense? So we can take from either side and insert. And hopefully, you can see, it's not a lot of work. It's just a few pointer flippings around. Do you think you should delete from the left or the right? Whichever's more heavy. I like the way you're thinking. Why delete from uh, the side that's more heavy? We could call these, for example, this is the parent. We often call these the brothers. Yes. So why would you carry the heavier brother up? Well, because he's harder to work with. He's harder to work with. Yeah, he's unbalancing the tree. So if we move him up, we're perhaps reducing the size of the tree on this side. So you could pick the longest one on both sides. Yeah, 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 yeah. Though you'd have to then calculate both the lengths on both sides, it's a bit of work, but I like the way you're thinking. So essentially, you can see he's sort of almost coming up with a, it's almost like a dynamic structure. It's not quite, but the structure is trying to maintain its balancedness through external operations. The other way that sort of is even easier than that that people try and do is, can you guess? Alternate. Alternate, yeah. Or pick them randomly. Will I delete on the left or will I delete on the right? Yeah. The problem with a tree is no matter how balanced it is when you start, it's, it's like so many things, after a few operations and inserts and deletes, it starts to go a bit skew with. And remember, we're facing this underlying problem of once a tree stops being really balanced, we start to lose our log n behavior. Once it starts getting really long fronds poking all the way down, um, then they're very expensive to traverse whenever we have to traverse them. And the more of them there are, the more likely it is we're going to have to traverse them. OK, so we've seen trees. We've seen um, how to delete from trees. You've seen search trees. Uh, oh, you've seen so many things. The last thing to say, and then we're going to have a quick break. Oh, oh. Oh, we'll still have a quick break. Uh, the last thing we're going to say, because I'm, I'm, we're not going to, I'm not going to have a core lecture today. I'm going to have an extension lecture. So this core lecture, after the break, we might dig in slightly to the extension lecture time, but then I'm going to give you an extension lecture. So we're not just going to lecture, 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 as we've been doing for each week. We're going to have a bit of fun. So um, I'm nearly there. Shh, 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 shh. Let's just have a break for a few minutes, because everyone's looking tired. And maybe we'll say... We'll come back in five minutes time and then I'll talk for another ten minutes and then we'll have another break and then we'll do the extension lecture. Okay, go. So you've got five minutes.